Well, good evening, everybody. And um, uh, I'm glad you could make it to this uh, book presentation here. I'll, whatever it is I'll be doing here. Um, uh, I'll be presenting my book, The Grand Delusion. This is my latest book. Uh, I guess Steve said enough about that. But, uh, you know, some years ago when I was working on this book, um, a very good friend of mine uh, came and asked me, he knew I was working on a book and uh, another book. And, and he said, uh, he, he wanted to know the title. And I said, The Grand Delusion. And right away, he just wrinkled up his face and said, The Grand Delusion? Oh, who's ever going to want to buy a book like that? I and mean, that's just terrible. It sounds like a real downer or whatever. But actually, uh, after I thought about it a bit and I realized, you know, uh, and I, I did search for other titles, but this really was the title and, and wisdom agreed with me. So that, that became the title of the book. But um, um, I could have called it, I guess, uh, Enlightenment, since um, Enlightenment really is nothing more than realizing delusion or seeing delusion, uh, recognizing delusion. And in uh, this book, is about that, but it's about the grand delusion, the thing that really keeps us um, from waking up to the real circumstance here that we're living out. And as a result of that, the kind of confusion that comes with that uh, leads to a great deal of pain and suffering and confusion for ourselves. And um, so this is a way of recognizing that, cutting through that, seeing this uh, for what it is. Uh, Though it might not seem that way as you course your way through the book, at least not at first, because uh, there's quite a few things to, to work uh, through in the process. But well, we're talking about um, questions that we might have, questions that seem to remain unanswered um, for us as we uh, course through life. And as we get older, perhaps uh, uh, it seems even more serious and dire that we really can't resolve some very basic things uh, that might be haunting us. And uh, questions like, and I'm gonna read this from the book, and it's not that I answer these in the book exactly, though I do take care of them, and pretty much any other kind of existential problem that you might have. The question is like, what is happiness? And how do I find it? Why do I quickly tire of things after I work so hard to acquire them? What do I really want? Why is there suffering? What, if anything, is truly good? How can we determine what is just or fair? What is consciousness exactly? What is real? What is true? Does God exist? What happens when I die? Is there some purpose to life? Do we have free will? Is human existence meaningful or absurd? How can I be sure of anything? So these kinds of questions can be um, lurking there for us. We might do a lot of things in our life to try to avoid those questions from creeping in, questions of, that, of those sorts, but um, most of us have a difficult time finding uh, just how to deal with them or to put them away. Maybe we can just uh, ignore them and get on with the things that we can get on with and uh, don't really quite come to grips with or even come to realize the deep suffering that might be going on uh, within our life that we're not giving any attention to. This book uh, cuts into this. But I, I want to ask here, with all these different kinds of questions, what do you suppose might be the ultimate question? That's the title of the first chapter. <laughs> I have a question here. It begins with a question. Uh, what is the ultimate question? And for Bertrand Russell, the ultimate question was, why is there something rather than nothing? For a lot of philosophers and, and thinkers, this has become the question. It was first posed uh, in, in such a succinct form, I believe, by uh, uh, Leibniz back in 1714. 
So here for Bertrand Russell, that was the ultimate question. And as a young man reading my Bertrand Russell, I came upon it and I thought, yeah, wow. I mean, that, that really is a question. Why is there something rather than nothing? So I go on here. Yeah, when I first came upon this question as a young man, I immediately felt that nothing could be more profound than knowing the answer to it. I quickly surmised, however, that there was no easy way to find out. How could we possibly know? Asking this question is like throwing it into a boundless void. How could we expect such a question to bounce back with an answer? It was as if, once launched, the question only ranged ever outward, propelled by its own inertia, never to return. It was at once both unanswerable and utterly compelling. And for quite some time, it haunted me. It haunted my thoughts like a specter. And uh, fortunately, I did encounter that early in life. <laughs> and I did, it always kind of lingered in my mind, it seemed, for a long time, until I began to see some things about this question. It, though it did take uh, quite some time, or maybe a couple of decades or more. But why is there something rather than nothing? Here, I'll go right to the beginning of the book. This is where I begin. Humans have grappled with some version of this existential question for millennia. Yet today we seem to be no closer to, to answering them than were our forebears of hundreds of generations ago. Not hundreds of years ago, hundreds of generations ago. This goes back. Does God exist? What does it mean to exist? What is mind? What constitutes measurement? Now, of course, this might not seem like much of a question, but to physicists, this is a huge problem. So there could be all kinds of other little questions we might not even give some consideration to until we look at them. We can ask, what is this exactly? What is this world? How did we get here? Where are we going? Where did we come from? All sorts of questions like this are waiting there for us to notice them. And if we do, what are you going to do with these questions? This is what this book deals with, totally and thoroughly. Uh, we could just move on from these questions. I go on here. But what exactly is motion? So here we have another question. What is motion exactly? You ever think about that? How can something move where it is? How can it move where it isn't? So what is motion? What is going on here? and things are moving. We start to look at the world carefully. We happen to ask some of these questions. We might begin to realize that whatever it is that we put together in our mind to make sense of this world, with just a little poking and prodding, we might begin to realize that it isn't holding up very well at all. And even though consciously on the surface here, we're not, maybe not, we're not so aware of that, but underneath it all, there is this uncertainty that lingers in our mind. We don't know what's going on. And that's a very difficult place to be. And we suffer over these. We might come up with our little answers here and there, four little groups that think this or think that, and then we begin to fight. These are massive problems for us human beings. But all of these fundamental questions, I'm going on with the book here, all of these fundamental questions and many, many more stem from a single error, a single unwarranted belief, a single grand delusion. Clarifying this grand delusion is the aim of this book. Because if we can clarify it, if we can bring it into view, again, this is enlightenment, is to see, enlightenment is seeing delusion, seeing just what this is. And this can go all the way to the grand delusion upon which virtually everything that we build within our minds and in our thinking and in the societies and the structures that we build of all sorts uh, are caught up with this. The, well, this grand delusion underlies pretty much everything that we touch or think or feel or experience. Going on with this uh, introduction, most of what follows is a dialogue between me and anyone. A naive but earnestly questioning character who could be, well, 
anyone, a person of any gender, any age, who may, uh, who may be anywhere on spectrums of learned and benighted, pious and profane, serious and silly. <laughs> so this is this anyone character uh, who I'm interacting with through this book. So this book is a, uh, is a dialogue between me and this character, anyone. And I thought I'd like to give you just a little, uh, I was told that people like to hear about writers, uh, how they go about writing things. I, it's hard for me to, to do that because I really don't know. And every time I write a book, it's different. So I, I don't have any, but with this particular book in dealing with uh, the kinds of questions that uh, you know, I was uh, poking around and prodding, uh, I'd, I'd work in the morning. Usually when I'm writing, I'll, I'll spend uh, most of my morning uh, writing. And then around noon or so, a little later, perhaps uh, at some point, I, I've had it for the day, at least uh, uh, the writing part of it. And so I just get up and take a walk. I live near a lake. And uh, so it's nice uh, uh, just to walk around the lake every day, as I used to do. It's getting harder for me to do that now uh, in my old age. But uh, um, but that's, that's the pattern that I had, that right in the morning generally, go for a walk around the lake, and, I, and I'd always carry a notepad with me, especially if I was writing. And um, all kinds of questions would come flooding uh, into my mind about what I was writing, <laughs> what I was working on that morning, because everything I was writing about, uh, I could just hear people questioning me at every turn. You know, Why this? What would, do you really mean that? How could this be? endless and at some point and I, and I and I didn't want this to end up being a big heavy pedantic uh, you know ph philosophical tome or something like this that uh, would be very difficult to read even though some of the material in here is uh, everyday kind of stuff a lot of it is but then we get into some pretty heavy questions here and there and I didn't want to make this too daunting for the reader but it, it, then it just dawned on me, well, here the, here's this person in my mind asking questions at every turn. And this could be, these questions could be coming from anyone, I realized. And uh, so I thought, you know, I can write the book this way. And uh, so that's how I ended up arriving at uh, writing for the first time in my life, uh, a, a dialogue <laughs> uh, form of a book. And, um, and it, it seems to work. I wasn't too sure at first, uh, but then when I showed it to a few people, uh, uh, they also agreed. So anyway, this is the form that it's in, but I think it does make it uh, more readable than it could be otherwise. But so here we have anyone, a person uh, uh, of any uh, age or gender, anywhere on the spectrum of learned or benighted, pious and profane, serious and silly. But what I point out uh, in this book, uh, you know, it, it, dealing with these questions, that sort of thing, if you feel like if you're reading the book and you feel like there's some questions here that you have that anyone doesn't take care of for you, I'd say just be patient and I would suggest that maybe you try to finish the book first, and just see if I uh, get to your question. But if not, you can go to the website. I created a website for this book and uh, this is the address. It's mountainsaremountains.com, but it's not spelled out mountains are mountains, it's just the abbreviation of mountains. That's MTS, right? Mountain is MT, and mountains is MTS. So it's just MTS R, the letter R, MTS, mountainsaremountains.com. And uh, you can go there now, and there's, uh, there's already some questions up uh, that readers of the manuscript uh, uh, submitted. So uh, just getting the website into shape. Uh, I was asking for a few questions if anyone had any. <laughs> so it does work and uh, you can send in a question if you have one. Um, I might not get back to you right away and you won't be identified on the website, um, uh, but you, your question will be there. And uh, if I would hope that, first of all, that you do read the book and that the question is relating to the book. Um, and uh, uh, and also maybe don't make it too long or uh, you know convoluted or anything of that sort. I might have to pare it down a bit, but you can see how the, the questions appear on the website now. If you just go there, um, just go to a place where it says Ask Steve, and then there's a mechanism in there where you can actually submit the questions to me. 
Uh, and if I, if, if for whatever reason, you know, some days later, perhaps uh, you might see my response to it. And then uh, if, if I don't respond uh, on the website, I will respond to you directly uh, in, in one way or another. But you should get confirmation uh, as soon as you submit the question uh, that it, it has uh, been received. So, okay, but that, that's available for you. And then there's a number of other things on, on that website too, if, if you want to check it out. Um, but if so, if you have any questions, if anyone doesn't quite cover it for you, uh, please, uh, you know, send them to me if you can. Right now, I'd just like to mention a few things about uh, what you might find in the book, the kinds of topics. Well, I guess I've already sort of indicated this to some degree. There's quite a bit about belief in here, though uh, somewhat indirect, at least in the first part of the book. I didn't even realize I was referring or referencing that as often as I did uh, in the first part of the book. The first part of the book is perhaps more secular. Uh, second part, getting uh, more into uh, not so much religious issues, but uh, uh, but just getting into a broader perspective of how we can look at the, uh, the deep existential kinds of issues and things that we might encounter in life. But belief is an issue that uh, runs quite a bit through this book. The book I did I mention already? The book I was working on before I uh, before I got to this one, I gave up on it finally after a couple of years. But it was a book on belief. But, and I must say that belief uh, doesn't fare too well in this book, but um, it gets to the heart of what our confusion is. It has to do with what we think and the views that we grip and hold to. And we'll be examining uh, many of those and uh, show that they don't hold up too well. And, that, and far from this being a source of comfort for us, hanging on to beliefs, uh, we can actually begin to see that this is a, a kind of a source of sorrow and pain and misery and confusion uh, for us. So that's uh, part of what uh, we'll be dealing with in this book. Uh, also consciousness and mind, uh, we'll be looking at that. Existence, what does this even mean uh, that we're here? And basically just reality, truth itself, but more than awareness, we'll be looking at all of these things. But more than this, kind of woven through the book, it isn't brought out as a topic or spoken of in any way directly. But this is about getting outside the box, so to speak, getting, getting uh, you know, freeing ourselves of our habitual ways of looking at things or accounting for things or thinking about things, which really, once we can get up to a larger space, a higher view or whatever, a bit more distant view, we can see, uh, I'm hoping that it'll be like a breath, breath of fresh air where we can be, begin to see outside the tight confines of of our minds and our, our thinking and our worries and fears and, and uh, self preoccupation and all this sort of thing. So that's uh, something that's also uh, working its way throughout the book, just to, how to free our minds and so we can begin to uh, realize in a fresh way uh, just what it is that we're living out here. Uh, then also, I just want to say a little bit about how to approach uh, this book. Uh, many of the readers of my other books, uh, Pat, I, the feedback I get from readers. One very common thing I, I hear from readers is that uh, uh, many of you read the book more than once, maybe twice or multiple times, and or perhaps from time to time you come back to it. And uh, so I know that a number of you or those who are, might be likely to pick up this book uh, approach uh, you know, at least my books in this way. And this book will hold up to that, I think, very well. Um, and uh, what I would encourage you, to, if you're one of those readers, if, if you think you're just going to look at it and toss it away, well, that's fine. Then I would suggest you read the end notes as well. <laughs> but otherwise, if you're one who might just, uh, uh, you know, you're probably going to come back to it. I would suggest just reading through the dialogue. That's the main part of the text. So you can keep the flow of the dialogue uh, moving along uh, as you're reading. And it should read fairly easily as a as a dialogue. It's kind of maybe my version of my dinner with Andre, though it's not at all like my dinner with Andre, but it, it's, a, it's a dialogue. And, uh, uh, but I would encourage you to do that. There will be places in the text where I have these timeouts uh, where I'll supply some more information, background information that give more depth or whatever to whatever is being discussed. Uh, and I would encourage you to read, read that as well, though if you 
don't want to, if you feel like it's a little more than you, you need or whatever, you can easily skip over these. They are clearly uh, separate from the main text, so you can clearly uh, jump over those if you want. But I would, I would really recommend that you read those. And then after you've read uh, the text through, then I would suggest if you come back to it again now a second time, and it will be a different book when you read through it, I can almost guarantee that for you. A lot of my books, people tell me kind of read that way, but this one, I think more than any of the others that I've written might strike you that way. And if you do read it then a second time, uh, or if it's gonna be your only time, then I would say, check out the end notes. These are not just reference notes to sources and things like that. There's actually a lot of material. In fact, a good portion of the depth of, and breadth of this book uh, will be in the end notes. And I really would encourage you to uh, read it. You can get, if you have a physical book, you can get two, two bookmarks there so you can quickly uh, just jump to the end notes. <laughs> but I would really recommend uh, that you take that, uh, that up. This will add a, a quite a bit of depth to, to the discussion. And then beyond that too, there's uh, five appendices in the book where I break out into different areas where what's being discussed in this book can be applied to like appendix, uh, the first appendix, appendix A, I deal with, uh, it's titled The Trouble with Truth Theories. And again, talking about truth is a pretty important uh, uh, topic in this book. And uh, truth theories, uh, th these have been around for millennia actually. Uh, and uh, this is a big problem, or this is a very important thing for say epistemologists, those people who, philosophers who are very much interested in knowledge and the study of knowledge and what is knowledge. And uh, uh, because it, they see and rightly so that we can't really claim to have knowledge unless uh, what we're claiming to have knowledge about is true. But how do we arrive at truth? And that's the problem. And they, over the centuries, they've created various kinds of truth theories and they never seem to work. And nobody really gets on board. Uh, 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 well, none of the, put it this way, none of the truth theories that are out there, <laughs> do you have any large numbers of philosophers jumping onto one train or the other, one truth theory or the other? And there's a good reason for this is because they're all flawed in various ways. And, uh, but after we, you go through this book, I can show you very quickly in a few pages as to why uh, they're flawed and why they don't work. And, um, and then I can also show you that it's not necessary for them to work because the, the, our whole approach to truth, what it's been historically, is wrong. We don't have a correct idea or understanding of what truth is. And we're always uh, trying to get to truth uh, by way of belief, and uh, which is to grasp hold of ideas that we then will trust and think are true and real, even though we, in every case we can show that they're all flawed. This, this would seem like a, a totally devastating problem, but actually it isn't. Because all the while we're doing that, we have distracted ourselves from enlightenment, from directly seeing uh, the nature of truth and reality, which is available to us. And so that's, I point that out in, in that uh, appendix. So this, the second appendix deals with consciousness and mind, uh, and that's the largest appendix. Uh, and, uh, and there we really, uh, Plump, what time is that? I don't want to go on too long here, but uh, that's in three parts. In the first part, we get into kinds of, uh, uh, well, kinds of problems and issues that people, the uh, brain researchers and uh, 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 artificial consciousness pe uh, people, you know, uh, AI people and stuff like this, intelligence, artificial intelligence, uh, kinds of issues that they're dealing with um, and never really getting uh, past uh, what uh, David Chalmers called the hard problem as to how, how is it that chemical, electrical chemical processes in the brain give rise to subjective experience? They're, they're, they don't even touch that. They can't even get close to it. And yet uh, there they are and they keep working away. And after uh, 40, 50 years of this kind of research now, they still keep talking about consciousness as the mystery of consciousness. Even though how, how mysterious is it? It's already immediately experienced. It's just a matter that we're not looking at it properly. So we look at that a bit and then uh, they also ignore the fact that uh, like in quantum research and this sort of thing, getting into details of looking carefully at the physical world, uh, what physicists, what scientists have 
stumbled on is that somehow consciousness or mind is woven into the very fabric of reality itself. This uh, people uh, working on uh, consciousness and brain issues and all this sort of thing uh, don't even entertain any thoughts of that at all. But that but this is necessary, and I'll take you in the second part of that uh, uh, appendix, and we look at that very carefully, and um, uh, and then finally. Uh, in the third part, I'll put it all together. That's all summed up in about a page. Uh, it's very simple in the end, really, after looking at all the devastating problems that we seem to suffer otherwise. <laughs> but there it is. And uh, anyway, that's part uh, uh, appendix number two, appendix B. In appendix C, I give you a kind of a nice little story of, uh, of how we uh, human beings, we, we want to know, we want to understand our world. We want to understand how this takes place. And we can look at it historically, like I use the example of the flood, you know, the, uh, you probably know the story of Noah and the flood, but there's all kinds of myths and stories relating to some event that took place in the ancient world. And they all have their different kinds of, uh, uh, of ways of accounting for what took place. Well, uh, we'll look at that and languages and how a language is, uh, you know, uh, uh, broke out from the various kinds of people that were scattered after the, uh, this huge flooding took place. And we can tie that flooding together with other kinds of flooding that occurred around the globe as, a, as the earth was crawling out of the, the ice age that uh, broke about 15,000 years ago when the earth began to, to warm up. And uh, so it's kind of a nice uh, modern day myth <laughs> story. But there I'm trying to show how, you know, our, our attempts to explain the world to ourselves, you know, we resort to all these different kinds of, because we must know, we want to know. And so we'll invent stories of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Ulysses, not Ulysses, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, uh, anyway. But myths and stories uh, uh, that come together. Of course, we know Noah, there's Atrahasis, there's Utnapishtim and, and uh, Gilgamesh and uh, all sorts of things. People in Southeast Asia had stories of a giant uh, frog that swallowed up the oceans and spewed it out on the land. And Southern India, where we find that the bridge of uh, Rama that joined uh, what we call now called Sri Lanka to India was submerged and all of this. There's all kinds of things that come together uh that we can see and we can and us moderns now we can look at all of these things that none of these uh, uh ancient people were privy to uh and uh, put, even weave together yet again another narrative that will account for all of these various things and yet still we would be foolish to think that somehow we have nailed this down because the truth doesn't quite work that way and uh but this is um, uh what i'll be showing in that uh, part of the book there and then another appendix, Appendix D, where I have little snippets of uh, kind of issues where we can take what we've learned in this book and apply it to all kinds of problems in science and philosophy and religion. And I only give nine examples there. I originally had, uh, I think about 23 or something like that. But my editor, uh, Scott, who's I think uh, joining us here tonight, <laughs> but he wisely, uh, and I, I agree with him, so I ended up pairing it back, but he thought that should be pared back a bit. As indeed, uh, much of this um, uh, book has been pared back. Uh, the manuscript I had originally was about twice this size, <laughs> but rightly so. I, you know, I, uh, uh, Scott's a genius at uh, helping, uh, like in the case of the dialogue, and getting it to move along quickly and without getting bogged down in too many uh, deep, heavy-duty, pedantic sorts of things. So. Uh, so that got lightened up, but then now that brings me to another point then, that uh, this winter in January here at Dharma Field, and it'll be put out on Zoom, I'm sure, I think, I'm, I'm quite sure we'll be doing that. That's how we do things these, these days, actually. So <laughs> I'll have to do it because I can't go over there and meet with you in person. So anyway, but I'm going to lead a, a, a study group that will be starting in January. They'll give you some time to get acquainted with the book if this interests you at all. And uh, where we can go through um, the book and look at it in, in various ways and maybe we'll have opportunities to discuss some of these things and take questions and whatever. But also at that time, I'd like to take the opportunity to provide more examples of uh, other kinds of materials and things that we, uh, we uh, left out of the book. 
because uh, there's plenty of other things that, and the reason for this is where we go with this book, we're going to go right down to the very bottom of our assumptions about reality and straighten that out and show where we, uh, where we get it wrong. This, like I said, this all stems from a, a single unwarranted belief, a single grand delusion. And uh, we're going to get down to that. And by the way, I bring you to that point within a few chapters of the book. But then the rest of the book is there just to show you <laughs> how this applies uh, to virtually everything else that we experience and know. Okay, and I think uh, that might be everything I wanted to say about this. Uh, but thank you very much for showing up. I hope I aroused some interest uh, in you that you might want to check this book out. Um, it was a long time in coming for various reasons, um, but finally uh, here it is. I think that this is, of all the books that I've written, I think this is the, the thing that I really wanted to say, and uh, it, I think it's all there. But um, anyway, but thank you so much. It's good to see you this evening.